laser hair removal, skin resurfacing, Botox, injections. Some Canadian doctors have money-making opportunities on the side, and who's to stand in their way, right? But there is a shortage of family doctors. What happens then if those money-making ventures take them out of their publicly funded offices too much? And are there rules in place to govern these doctors and potential financial conflicts of interest that may arise? Joining us now to help answer these questions and others in Sydney, Nova Scotia, via Skype, Dr. Monica Dutt. She is chair of Canadian Doctors for Medicare, public health specialist and a family physician with the Cape Breton District Health Authority. And with us here in studio, Dr. Karen Dockrell. She is a pediatrician and perinatal specialist based in Whitby, Ontario. And of course, we welcome back André Picard, the columnist with the Globe and Mail. Okay, Dr. Dockrell, should we start with you here? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You, obviously, you're a doctor, but you had a business on the side that was a part of your practice. What was that called? That was the Mom and Baby Depot. And how long did you have that operating for? Uh, it ran from 2006 and really officially closed totally in 2012. And what kind of services were you offering? Well, Mom and Baby Depot was it's what we called a concept clinic. It was put together by families who told us what are the services they used and valued in the early years of parenting or growing kids till school age. We brought all those services into like a one-stop shopping experience. And with it, gave them access through a membership fee to breastfeeding consultants, to nurse educators, to parenting support programs, uh, some dental assessment, preventative health services, dietitians, many others. But really what was the gold feature of the program was a, the, um, what we called a well family care visit which was two hours based on the Bright Futures program out of the United States, what met with a family at the intervals of critical development of their baby and their child and offered them good anticipatory guidance, uh, problem solved with them about any challenges they were having as a family, well, not just a, with the health, but with the mom, the dad, and even extended family. All about keeping people were. healthier. Absolutely. That's the idea. You want a, a little health prevention, keep them out of the hospitals, treat their sicknesses when they have to, that type of thing? Absolutely, and gave them the tools to prevent some of those emergency mm -hmm. visits and other And services. you mentioned you charged your patients a fee for that. What was the there fee? There was. The fee, depending on how old your child was, was 500 to $2,000 a year. And people paid it? They did. And paid it unhappily, willingly? No, what? paid it very willingly, and to our surprise, we assumed it would only be a, va a product they'd value in the first year or two of life. They loved it and wanted to keep paying, so that year by year, it was well over 95% renewal. Now, that was a payment that was not covered by the health insurance plan. Absolutely So not. they went into their own pockets for that. Yes, they did. Who had a problem with that? Um, I guess a particular person um, who was consulted to me made a complaint to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And what did they do? Um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons basically looked at the issue stating that this particular family felt that they had to pay our membership fee to choose me to be their child's pediatrician. The interesting thing, however, is while I ran my business, Mom and Baby Depot, I ran a full-time consultation pediatric practice, totally OHIP covered. And this family was referred to me as a consultation. Hmm. They declined the consult and said, no, we want her to give us this service. Could you be a patient of yours and not be a part of the Mom and Baby Depot? As a consult patient, absolutely. But not otherwise? Um, not otherwise, and if you look at the details, because we provided well baby visits and immunizations, the college took the stance that we were providing their well baby care. And therefore, if I made a decision to provide a two hour well baby care visit, then under block billing rules, which we never said it was a block billing, we identified it as a membership, families should be able to say, well, I want a well baby visit, but I don't want to pay the fee for all the other stuff. So the college looked into all this, and what did they do? Um, basically, through their many different suggestions and legislation, um, they whittled away the business, and we finally decided to close in a settlement. You had to hire lawyers. Uh, I actually was represented through the Canadian Medical Protective Association. Okay, so you your premiums went towards your insurance coverage, which covered your legal fees. That's right. How much do you think it cost, though? Oh my goodness, for my legal team, I'm sure it's upwards of a half a million dollars. 
Um, I wonder what the college spent and in the investigations hmm. that they went through. And for us, it was a steady financial loss in, in trying to keep the business afloat and try to build to their satisfaction at what they were trying to do. So at the end of the day, you shut it down? We had to shut it down. Are you still practicing? I practice, yes I do. But My consultation this. practice continues to this day hmm. and, and has flourished. I read somewhere, in the, I think in the National Post, that you're thinking of leaving Canada because um, of all this. Yeah, you know what, I was. And in fact, quite honestly, I was advised that I should. That um, the college would always be on my case, shall we say. And uh, <clears throat> so I looked out at other options. Um, my family is here. And, uh, but my biggest challenge is that my license in Ontario remains restricted, which limits me applying for other positions. It limits me bringing in partners, uh, supervising young doctors, and many other things. Restricted because you ran afoul of because the college? Because I ran afoul. So you're, if I go to a post office, your poster's going to be there. You're, oh, it's you're huge. Wanted. If you go to the college site, I don't look like a very friendly person. <laughs> OK. Let's get some feedback on this. Dr. Monica Dutt, what do you think of this story? Well, I think it's fairly straightforward when we're talking about private for-profit care that people shouldn't have to pay for medically necessary services. And I think that's a, you can debate what, what's medically necessary or not, but in our system, you don't need to pay for things like immunizations and well baby checks. So I think it's fairly simple that people don't need to pay for that care. It's a little different when you're talking about for-profit aspects of it. So doctors are able to charge for other services that they may be offering. But I think in this situation and in others, you do get into difficulties when they're being offered under the same roof because you get into situations where there's the potential for profit to be the motivator as opposed to the care of the patient. And there's lots of examples of that, of people getting more testing than they needed, more treatment than they needed, because there is a profit motive either for the, the physician or perhaps for the, the investors in a company. And then the other aspect is, is the, the perception of the patient. So even if it's perfectly clear to the patient that they don't need to pay a fee to access certain care, they may think that they should pay that fee in order to get good care, even for things that are normally covered. Or they may feel like if they don't agree to the other services that they're being offered, they may not get good care overall. So I think there's there's different issues that, that come up that both they shouldn't have to pay for medically necessary covered services and that there's also the perception of the, the patient not being able to get good care if they don't pay that fee. Okay. Andre, you're here as the kind of honest broker overlooking all of this. This is one story, yeah. but I wonder how common this story is, namely a doctor's attempt to make some extra money outside of what is covered by the Ontario Health Insurance Plan. How often does that happen in our system? Well, we have a lot of doctors who work strictly on the government plan in the province they're on. They get all their income from that. That's easy, cut and dried. We have a small, very small percentage of doctors who opt out entirely. All their business is private. That's simple too. It's the little, what, what do we do with people who straddle both? That's, that's the really difficult one. Uh, it, you know, cases like this are not cut and dried, but what's wrong about this case is that the unfairness of it all. So unfairness are, to whom? Uh, well, to Dr. Dockroll, for example, and to the public, because they're, they're not sure what the rules are. Because there's all kinds of clinics like this that exist uh, with fees, with membership groups for adults, and they're perfectly fine. They don't get pursued by the college. Uh, people are willing to pay it. Should that influence our legislation? These are, these are really difficult areas. So what we're doing, is, as Dr. Dutt said, is we want to ensure that people get medically necessary care, that they pay for it. They don't feel pressured that they have to pay extra to get the care. How do you do that? How do you allow that and still have people straddle the line? So there's all kinds of gray areas, and, and they're getting grayer, if you will. But let me ask the overarching question, which is, should we have a problem with a doctor who wants to supplement his or her income by offering services on the side to willing patients that are not covered by OHIP? Well, that's not a, a yes or no answer, I don't think. I think I would answer it by saying that in a lot of the world, in the developed world, in universal health systems, that exists. So in all over Europe, you have this mixture of private and public. What they have that's different from us is much more clear regulation. So I would say to you, I can justify saying 100% we ban all mixing, you know, doctors are either private or public, you have to choose. That could be justified. Uh, 
But that's not the system we have. We have a system that kind of allows it, but it's not sure when. So I think it's what's required more than anything is some clarity. Let me see if I can get some clarity out of uh, Monica Dutt here. I, I presume from your first answer that you're not a fan of what Dr. Dockra was attempting to do. So I want to ask you, uh, do you charge patients for anything outside of what OHIP covers? I don't. And just to maybe expand a little bit, I wouldn't say that I disagree or agree with one model or another. I think, like Andre was saying, there's certain things that need to be clarified about what the best way to, to put a new model into place is. And for Canadian doctors from Medicare and myself, I think there's certain criteria that you can try to evaluate to see whether the new model that you're proposing will actually improve the health of, of your patients. So some of the things you need to look at is, is it a fair system? Can people access it? Are there barriers? So I would say most of the single mothers that I see can't afford $500 to $2,000 a year or whatever the fee might be. So I think that creates a barrier. It's looking at is it high quality care and is it clinically indicated care? So are patients getting care that they should be getting? Are they getting extra care? Are okay, no, I get you. I get you. But I, w I want to keep focused on this, on this issue of what's covered and what is not. Uh, we know of stories where there are family doctors, for example, who charge an annual fee just to be on the roster of this family doctor. We know if you ask your doctor to write a sick note for you, uh, they will charge a fee for that. If you want to leave that doctor and go to another doctor, they may charge you a fee for putting all their files together uh, and, and you know, the work that's required to organize those files and then so you can take them with to your new doctor. Uh, are, are, do you do any of that? I don't. I don't personally do it. And do it. you think doctors should not be allowed to do it? Um, I think it does take patient, uh, take physician time and effort to do that. So I think looking at how the different colleges across the country have dealt with it, they've at least put out rules and guidelines around what is reasonable to charge for all of those things. And doctors need to explain to their patients if they're charging more than those things. So I think things like sick notes and patient transfers and phone prescriptions, there are guidelines and rules out there that help doctors to be able to charge what seems to be a reasonable fee and they do have the option for not charging it and I in my case with my patients many of them I don't charge it because to be honest I think doctors do make a reasonable wage a reasonable amount of money and I don't need to charge someone ten dollars twenty dollars for something that they might not be able to afford so I think doctors have that option and I think colleges well, what about okay what about charging it to people who can't afford it and just not charging it to people who can't afford it I tend not to do either. I th again, I think that doctors are paid reasonably for the, the things that they do, and I don't feel a need to, to charge extra. That being said, there are guidelines that put out reasonable amounts to charge for things like that, um, things like sick notes and other things that, that aren't really much quite costly, but for some people they are costly. Okay, let me go to Dr. Dockrell with this. You knew when you were doing this, you were, I mean, you're kind of, yeah, you're, you know, nudging up to the edge of, you know, what's uh, kosher in this country, right? Absolutely. And you knew you'd be, you know, spitting in the face of some um, regulatory bodies or, or, for example, people who share the view of Dr. Monica Dutt that think that what you're doing shouldn't be allowed, but you did it anyway. Right. I did notify those bodies, though. You notified them. Okay. Yeah. But did you, did you at any point in this process think to yourself, you know, I'm just inviting a whole heap of trouble upon my head here. Why don't I just do this and not charge all the extras and I can look like I'm very close to God on all this and I won't have any legal fees. Uh, 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 you know what, it was an interesting time because in 2006, uh, a group of private clinics were looking at coming into Ontario from uh, BC and they were in the press and at that time, uh, the then Minister of Health made it very public and said anybody will be charged a fee or will have to pay a fine if you provide it <laughs> and or you buy it. So when we opened, they weren't running through our door, <laughs> you know, to come in. Um, and yes, we recognized we were on, uh, on a cusp, but we felt very much, and my background, having worked in hospitals and, and worked with mothers and babies, um, felt very strongly that there was a, a detriment to the services they needed and if they couldn't access them. So the best example is breastfeeding. Probably the best public health initiative ever. Mm -hmm. It's got a long-term payback, but you have to be able to wage through there to get it. I felt very much that I needed to find a way for women to get it. So why didn't you just offer the service and have OHIP pay for whatever OHIP pays for in that case? The OHIP pays for none of it. And in fact, my question to OHIP was, what can I bill if I assist a mother with breastfeeding? And they told me zero. 
that OHIP does not cover breastfeeding support. Does that make sense? Well, it doesn't make sense, but that's the unfairness part mm -hmm. I pointed to. I can go out and hire a breastfeeding consultant tomorrow, pay them whatever I want. She won't be pursued by the college. If that person happens to be a doctor, they will be. Mm -hmm. So wh what sense does that make? Uh, I can hire a doula, pay her whatever I like, but I can't hire an OBGYN to do extra stuff for me. But my recollection is, been through this a few times, mm -hmm. when you have a kid, not me, but when, when a child is had, in the hospital, somebody in the hospital comes and gives advice on how to breastfeed, right? Doesn't that happen? Fairly brief, though. You know, your hospital stay is at max 60 hours. Um, in the hospital, the nurses are all given some training in breastfeeding. Most hospitals may have one, perhaps two lactation consultants. So you were offering above and beyond. Oh, breastfeeding really requires the support in the first two months help families understand it, stick with it, keep going. And our outcome for breastfeeding was 80% success and continuation at five months. So worth the money in your view? Well worth the money. Well worth the money. Mm -hmm. Let me read this. This is from healthydebate.ca from just a couple of weeks ago. This is from Nan Okun, uh, an OBGYN at Mount Sinai here in Toronto who recently blogged about traditional obstetrical and gynecological practices and also offering aesthetic or cosmetic procedures. She writes, one concern I have is around a potential professional conflict of interest that might come from having the same OBGYN delivering both insured and non-insured services under the same roof. For example, I worry that women seeking medical advice and counsel concerning sexual health will be influenced, consciously or not, to purchase products or undergo expensive procedures that are not medically necessary. Now, Andre, in your view, has she put her finger on a potential conflict of interest that doctors find themselves in? Oh, it's definitely a potential conflict of interest. The issue is how do you manage it? And so, you know, again, I come back to how does the rest of the world manage it? Well, they manage it with pretty strict regulation. So say you're in Europe, you're an OBGYN, you do your public service and it's laid out. If you want to practice in the private sector, then you have to put in X number of hours in the public service. So it's all legislated, regulated. We, we don't have that in Canada. In Canada, we have, uh, well, you really shouldn't do it, but if you do it, uh, we're not sure we want to know about it. it. There's just a lack of clarity, and it's not fair to the physicians. It's not fair to the public. Dr. Dutt, would you like to see a prohibition on this type of activity altogether? I think, again, I wouldn't say a prohibition altogether. It's taking each model case by case and seeing if it compromises patient care. So, for example, in Toronto, there's the Kensington Eye Institute, a private not-for-profit site that does provide care and doesn't charge patients beyond what it would cost for the procedure. So I think there's ways to do it. And even looking at the breastfeeding example, I am normally working in public health and no question breastfeeding is essential but I would like everyone to be able to access similar levels of care as opposed to just the people who are wealthy who can afford the care so I think we need to look at ways to make it accessible to more people as opposed to just the people who can pay for it. Dr. Dockrell, should we be concerned that if doctors have this added interest on the side that it um, never mind the business case it might actually take them away from the time that they might spend doing health insurance plan covered services that we need. Right. Uh, that was an issue that was raised with me. As I say, I ran a consultation practice at the same time I did it. Um, as the mom and baby depot grew, without doubt, I had less time for my consultation practice. However, I work pretty heavy hours per week. And if I was, as many female physicians choose to work only 20 hours a week, does that take time out of the public service? Um, I was actually told at one point that if I choose to give a two-hour well baby visit to my membership, then I need to give that two-hour well baby visit to anybody who wants it yeah. and get paid $32. Now we can all see that's not practical. Um, my choice was to make sure that I balanced and that I followed the code of ethics. Um, in making sure that I didn't impose unreasonable expectations on families. But here's an example you hear, Andre, and uh, help me understand whether you think this is right or wrong. Uh, you take your kid to the doctor. A kid goes in, gets a checkup. Nasty cough. Doctor says, hmm, probably should get those lungs x-rayed. Uh, go down the hall, make a left. There's an x-ray room there. Here's the yep. form. Get your x-ray. Oh, by the way, I own that x-ray lab. The doctor. Is that a problem? 
Well, there's again a potential for conflict, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to order more x-rays because you're going to get uh, a fee on that? How could you not? Well, you know, a lot like of... Really, how could you not be perceived as not, because of the financial no. interest, how could you not be perceived as saying, of course I'm going to send you for more x-rays when in doubt because I make money from it? Well, a lot of doctors think they're immune from that. You know, <laughs> they think they're immune from visits from pharma reps, etc. So the, the question is, I, I think openness. The public should know that that's the case, first of all. Uh, can we ban that? I'm, I'm not sure we can. There, there's all kinds of gray areas. Uh, what happens when, you know, it's not just x-rays, there's pharmacies. So what happens when a doctor's office gets free rent from the pharmacy that's downstairs? Because they know the patients, 90% of them, hey, there's a pharmacy downstairs, I might as well fill my prescription right now. Mm -hmm. Do people know that? Generally not. Uh, you know, this was a big case in, in Quebec uh, where they, there was an ethics debate about that and the college ruled on it. But there's a thousand and one of these things. Uh, what about the doctor who works four days a week, <coughs> does wonderful care, takes Fridays off to do Botox treatments and makes more than in the rest of the week. Right. Is that worse than what Dr. Dockrell was doing, charging $500? You know, hmm. it, it's, I don't know what, maybe the college should have better targets, I'm not sure. But it's the, it's the unfairness of it that I, I keep coming back to. Dr. Dutt, it does sound as if it's, I mean, Andres I mean, made a good point here. There, it's hard to, I should ask, is it difficult to operate, quote unquote, ethically as a doctor uh, in any province in Canada today because of all of these potential built-in conflicts or some of the other things we've been talking about here tonight. I think it is because I think it's not just the perception that your doctor might be asking you to do something to make money. I think we do have evidence that it has happened, not in all cases, but there are studies and examples that show that people do get more treatment, do get more lab work, do get more imaging done. So we know that that can happen. So I think you just, you do need to be careful. So even with Botox injections, for example, keeping it separate, it's not necessarily that I'd say don't make the money off the Botox injections, but making it clear that it's separate from the patients that you're seeing and not just referring them because you know you can make that money from them if you think that it's what they need and if it's good patient care because I think ultimately that's what physicians should be doing advocating for good patient care then you can argue for it but if the profit became the, the primary motive then that's when it shouldn't be the acceptable thing okay. to do okay here's the follow-up though and that is that yes doctors uh, obviously do no harm you've got your Hippocratic Oath you obviously don't go through 10 years of medical school or whatever it ends up being because at the end of the day uh, all you care about is money and you don't care about people. Having said that, doctors are self-employed professionals. They are, in some respects, entrepreneurs as well. Do you really want to take the entire business side of the equation away from them? I think, again, doctors make a, a reasonable amount of money. There's a lot of discussion right now around how much doctors make, even if they don't charge privately. So our physician associations negotiate contracts, negotiate fees. They're able to make their wages in that way. And if they feel they need to make extra money, that should be done in a way that does not compromise the, the care of the patient that they're seeing and does not lessen any of the access to things that, that are covered. So I think that we're able to make a reasonable amount of money and it shouldn't need to go into profit. But if you do, then it needs to be separate from the patient care that you're giving that is covered under, under Medicare. And I think it is a bigger discussion of what is covered as Andre mentioned earlier there's lots of things that aren't a lot of pharmacy long-term care home care all essential parts but in our system we do cover physician and medical and hospital care so those things at least need to be protected uh, dr. doctor I'm just curious if I asked you before all this started and you had just set up your depot if I said describe yourself what's your title what's the first thing you would have said for mom and baby depot yeah um, I was the medical director and owner if I said, are you a small business person, what would yes, you... Yes, I was an entrepreneur. You were yes, an entrepreneur as well. Yes. Did you see anything inconsistent between being a doctor and being an entrepreneur slash small business person? Um, I was very careful, I believe, in making sure that I maintained my OHIP practice and what I saw as an OHIP practice. Um, it was very interesting in Mom and Baby Depot in that uh, we did provide immunizations, but we had to bill OHIP for that piece of it. So the m membership fee families paid did not include what we would bill to OHIP. 
And what was interesting in the model is as we identified that there were more and more mental health needs for our patients, we had to find a way to keep interacting with OHIP to help families avoid having to pay excessive fees. Hmm. Our challenge was to find the right fee to match the service they needed. There are some people, Andre, in this country, lots of people, I suspect, who believe that doctors ought to be doctors, and that's it. And this notion of being self-employed professionals or this notion of being entrepreneurs or small business people really ought not to enter into the conversation. Do those people need to get over it? Well, you know, the reality is most doctors are just doctors, right? So this, the debate we're having, we don't know what percentage of doctors it applies to, but it's a small percentage. So as Monica said, most doctors are well paid under the public system, whether it's fee for service or salary, and they don't get into this. But the question is, do we want to discourage the minority of entrepreneurs? And I, I don't see any benefit from doing so. Why, why would we want to discourage that? We talk about the need for innovation. You know, it's, we need people who push the boundaries, even if it makes us uncomfortable. That, that's how things change. Sometimes they change for the worse, that's life, but often they change for the better. So I, I think we want to encourage this. But to me, it's about good regulation. It's about articulating, well, why would we restrict things? Which we are not doing. Not in any way, I don't think. Not in any way. No. Co the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ontario isn't doing it. Well, The National the Canadian Health Association isn't doing it. What they come back to is, you know, the two most important words in the Can Canada Health Act, medically necessary. Mm. They're not defined. Well, what does it mean? Mm. So depending on the... the where you work, you know, if you're working with kids, they're a little more, oh, the definition's a little stronger than if you're working with adults. Well, why? Hmm. So it, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions there. Uh, let's, we've got a few minutes left here, and I want to finish up on this. This is a quote from Dr. Ian Bookman, a gastroenterologist at St. Joseph's Health in Toronto, also medical director of the Kensington Screening Clinic, who also blogged about the issue of private clinics offering public services. And here's what he said. In my opinion, there are two reasons why people are against private clinics, and both have to do with fear. Number one, fear of change of the status quo, and number two, fear of the word private. Subscribers to these misperceptions offer fear-mongering stories, conjuring images of substandard private clinics with illegal practices that abuse the healthcare system, stealing public money in the name of greed. These perceptions are inaccurate and misleading. Here are two truths that should replace these misperceptions. Number one, the status quo needs to change. And number two, private is not a curse word in medicine. Uh, Dr. Dutt, let's start with you on this. Do you think private is a dirty word in medicine? You know what, I'd agree with both of those premises. So it's not private, that's the dirty word. I'd say it's for profit, that's the dirty word that we need to have more conversation about. But that is the difficulty you get into when you start bringing into the for profit aspects of things, because then that starts often, not always, but often to, to erode some of the basic of our basis of our Medicare system. And I agree with this first premise, the status quo isn't acceptable. We've, as an organization, been advocating for changes in a number of different areas, and there's lots of great examples across the country. <laughs> It's not about what model of care should we be. It's about the types of models of care that we should be using and not the private side of it, but the for-profit side that needs to have the bigger discussion. Do you want to make a distinction between what's private and what's for-profit? In other words, one's okay, one isn't? Good question. Um, there are many public services that are delivered by private agencies, um, and that's often not well understood by the, uh, by the public. Um, labs in particular are all privately owned. They provide public services and get paid a fee for that. I think the, the whole issue is that private delivery of public services can be done well. Um, it can be done to expand the services that we now have. And I believe in the hands of people who are ethical and value our universal health care system, it will improve universal health care. Yeah. Andre, last word to you. Well, it comes back to a discussion we had at the outset of the show. You know, Tommy Douglas never said everything should be covered, right? Mm -hmm. But the question is, how, how much do you allow people to buy the other stuff? So how much should the Medicare system, the public system provide? What are the essentials? And then once we've decided that, well, what do we do with people who want more? Do we allow it? Mm -hmm. Well, why not? You know, is it going to harm the others? If it doesn't harm others, uh, if everybody gets basic, really good care, then what's the harm? What's the harm? 
And it's always about harm in medicine, yep, isn't it? Absolutely. It's supposed to be. Are you totally sick of our healthcare system right now? No, I'm You're not. You're not disgusted with I the whole thing? I am not. No? I, I would love to see our universal system include dental care, some eye care, many, many other features. But I, like many others, want to know what medically necessary is. And if it isn't in our public pocket of what we can provide, then I want to look at some good low-risk insurance availability to people to receive those services. Gotcha. Thanks, everybody, for this discussion. Dr. Monica Dutt via Skype in Sydney, Nova Scotia. She's with Canadian Doctors for Medicare and the Cape Breton District Health Authority. Thanks very much, Dr. Dutt, for being there down east for us. Dr. Karen Dockrell, the pediatrician and perinatal specialist from Whitby, Ontario. Andre Picard, who we read in the Globe and Mail. How often are you in the Globe? You're in there at least a couple times a week, at aren't you? At least a couple of times. At least yeah. a couple of times a week. There we go. Thanks so much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.